Hello, hello. Is this is this on? I can't tell. Yes. Okay. Kind of. It's not a big room. Um, that's but the, it's also for the online. Oh right. Room. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I I'm John Woodward. I'm your sweaty introducer. Um, <laughs> thank you all for being here. Um, it's always amazing. This is going to sound like I pre-wrote it because I completely wrote it ahead of time. Um, <clears throat> it's always amazing to see so many people crammed into this small space. <laughs> And you may think you stuffed yourselves in here for poetry, but I submit that you are wrong. <laughs> you can get poetry anywhere. Go to Fenway Park. They're probably about to start losing to the Marlins right now. Uh, Why stuff yourself in here? Uh, you may not know. Um, uh, you may not know this, but it's precisely these other people that you're here for, the joy of shared experience. In this incredibly special place, you might find yourself looking up at the black and white portraits on the walls. Uh, up there, um, portraits which seem to memorialize individual achievement, each poet posing as if at the moment of stark insight, the angelic creases of solitary agony march marking each face. And a lot of these poets are cool, but I submit that this form of portraiture too begets a false idea of solo heroism. Were it not for the aggregate, the collective effect of all of the portraits, these people needed their friends and they needed each other as we all do. Poetry works when we make space for each other. There's not a lot of space unless we make it. Your three readers tonight, in addition to their own practices, have each found ways to make space for other poets, whether through teaching, through running reading series, through dedicated and generous and thoughtful criticism, or through performance and collaboration. I'm excited to be here with you tonight and to make space for them. Uh, two quick other things. First, a hard and fast rule. By the power vested in me as your introducer, I hereby decree that if you like someone's reading, you have to go up to them and tell them. <laughs> you can't just enjoy it and then walk out. You are not some kind of malfunctioning automaton. Give a thumbs up from across the room if you must, but you have to convey your appreciation somehow. <laughs> Second, less of a rule and more of a suggestion. You will feel good and you will have done something good if you're able to buy these poets' books. Uh, meet the poets afterwards and ask for their signature. Um, so I'm going to read their bios in quick succession, and then they'll come up in that same order. Uh, Jonica Stuckey is a mystic poet, performer, and founding editor of the award-winning press Black Ocean. He is a two-time national haiku champion and is the author of four poetry collections, including Ascend, Ascend from Third Man Books 2019, which was released as a live performance with cellist Lori Goldston by Neurot Recordings in May 20, 2023. His writing has appeared in a variety of publications such as the Huffington Post and Poetry Foundation and has been profiled in The Believer, Vice, and Bomb magazine. He incorporates esoteric and occult influences to develop a trance poetics, which he has taught or performed in over 60 cities around the world. You can learn more about him and his work at jonicastuckey.com. Elisa next, correct? Elisa Gabbert is the author of six collections of poetry, essays, and criticism. Most recently, Normal Distance from Soft Skull 2022 and The Unreality of Memory and Other Essays, FSG 2020, which was a New York Times editor's pick and finalist for the Colorado Book Award. She writes the On Poetry column for the New York Times and her work has appeared recently in Harper's, The Atlantic, and the New York Review of Books, and The Believer. Her next nonfiction book, Any Person is the Only Self, will be published by FSG in 2024. Uh, finally, Joe Hall is a Buffalo-based writer and reading series curator. His five, his five books of poetry include Fugue and Strike, 2023, and Someone's Utopia, 2018. He has performed and delivered talks nationally at universities, living rooms, squats, and rivers. His writing has appeared in places like Postcolonial Studies, Poetry Daily, Best Buds Collective, Terrain.org, Peach Mag, Pen America Blog, Dollar Bills, and an NFTA bus shelter. He has taught poetry workshops for teachers, teens, and workers through Just Buffalo and the WNY COSH Worker Center. Uh, get in touch with Joe at johalljohal.com. That's say it, say it twice uh, when you put it into your browser. Uh, please join me in welcoming all three of them. And uh, I want to say thank you to John for agreeing to MC tonight. Um, 
known each other for a long time, but I don't know how long. <laughs> 15 years, maybe more, yeah. maybe more than that. Um, my name is Jonica Stuckey. Uh, tonight I'm wearing glasses. Um, it's uh, a privilege, and um, I mean that in the sincerest possible way uh, to be reading with these two readers tonight. Um, for those of you who don't know, I'm the publisher of Black Ocean, which means uh, I've published five of Joe's books and three of Elisa's books. Um, and <clears throat> for those of you who don't know much about independent publishing, that means I really like their work. <laughs> Um, and so as a, as a, as a publisher and as a poet, it's really great to read with them tonight. And I just came off of a tour behind this album, um, that was like very performative and theatrical and huge and <clears throat> with music and incense and candles and trance states of somatic possession and all this stuff. And um, <clears throat> and so tonight I thought, I'm just gonna do that again and blow it out of the water. <laughs> uh, no, tonight what I'm doing, <laughs> surprise. Um, I'm going to read all new poems. Um, I think every poem I'm reading tonight, except for the, um, first one I wrote in October of last year, uh, which were the first new poems I had written in a number of years. And they are like the opposite end of the spectrum from that ascend, ascend, trance, ritual, poetic, performative space. These are quiet, quieter, softer poems. And I read them for the first time out loud earlier today. So you guys are going to hear them to my ears for the second time. We'll see how it goes. I'm not convinced they're good, <laughs> but this is a safe space, right? So. <clears throat> you speak to me in many voices, in the voice of the North Wind, in the voice of wolves, in the voice of a severed head, in the voice of giants. In the voice of these white months spent like a whisper dragging the body, its most beloved dead, across the nightlit snow. To remember is to live alone in a world of wounds. To forget is to be brushed by the colorless roots of orchids. All things exist by virtue of the secret names that dwell inside them. And so let us seek that which awakens the warmth of my hand upon your cooling skin. Our teeth in the dark glistening so that we might gaze upon a dreaded moon. Your unwashed hair fragrant and tender as bread, which feeds the one who destroys it. How hungry we are now for awe. Begin with death in space desiring self. Somewhere a great golden crown of candles burns in the black above us. Long stalactites of wax lowering their pale spilts. You live in me and readily rise from the bottom of my night at my least word and flow in my saliva. Rise with the undefinable despair of one who has dreamed horrors you cannot remember. 
a tree on fire in the dark, a vessel empty of another's pleasure. If angels are the teeth of God, we are the tongue which sings and suffers between. Cutting strawberries on the sunlit board, their milky pith robed in flesh, brighter than blood. An excess of diamonds glistening across every seed, I am consecrated again into that untransformable final hour when it was your hands moving with a hunger possessed of teeth instead of fingers. Mountains veiled in milk and rose. The outpouring of a continent of sky into the julep darkness. How rich the burning tree. The stain and chill in the throat of a lily. The sun's blood on your cheek and a cloud like a drenched swab descending behind your blackening sigh. I was joking with Elisa on the way over here that I feel like these are like my middle-aged poems, like I'm 45 and I'm writing poems about like cutting fruit. <laughs> poems about cutting fruit. <laughs> Clouds moving swiftly across a slate-colored sky, the whiff of wood smoke on a vagrant breeze and the violet light, calm and sweet. Somewhere within the vault of my bosom, a tiny bird begins to sing. I feel a love so universal, it draws into its fiery atmosphere all things, because they are all things. A ray of light pierces my chest like a slender spear. A vapor of tears through which I rise and fall as I am both weak and strong. The blood flowing in my veins like a black revolt and I must die or break forth into leaves and flowers. The flower I gave you, that was actually me wanting to touch you in a way that was forever. I wonder if Given that we have no plans to see each other, I will forever feel anything else for you but this longing, an itinerary towards nothing, the winter darkness like a black sea. The wet sigh of skin as I collapse across the body of my destroyer. So small a sound in the enormous night. The first synthesis is between lovers when they are two but feel as one. The second is the same reply from the mystic to the divine. The third synthesis recognizes that even this is nothing. 
a stag at bay turning upon the hounds. A pride of stance, a shaking of antlers. A hectic beauty struck with thorny splendor, head tilted like a sparrow's. Plumes of saffron smoke drifting out from the wound. Of my son, the singing bird. This is another uh, middle-aged poem because it's about the birth of my son. So something that you write about when you're 45. <laughs> <clears throat> it was actually, um, <clears throat> I don't like contextualizing poems, as you can probably tell, other than saying how old I was when I wrote them. <laughs> um, but my son was born at home as a home birth, and I got to um, doula the birth and literally be in the birthing pool with my wife and put him on her chest. And it was um, like the most amazing experience I've ever had. You come into the world instantaneous as the lullaby of half a million years. Silver ink of moonlight tracing great dunes of your ear a cathedral's bright lines from the black liana of night. Your tiny body disarticulated and prodigious, apocalyptic, miraculous, and transient. Its brilliant radii caparisoned in rags torn from the sun itself. I am set aflame with leprous brilliance where your breath falls unopposed upon me. Somewhere, trumpets of Lantana announce the weapon the world will turn you into. It's a complicated thing being the father of someone who will become a white man in America. After the news. After the news, I go for a walk. Thorn tree after thorn tree emerge in the pale light and become specters. The whole mass, a radiant, jagged triangle against the darkness. Clouds like plump pink bodies across a slate of sky. One for a glorious golden gray. How will the first sunrise be after my death? The worm, the rat, the star, a spur of spear grass, sun struck and enormous entangled in the terror of a flowering day. Nothing can pain me anymore. I am no longer the one you knew. I am alive. I am in love with all things. Pain and all things. A few more.
burgeoning the vast summer, I tremble in the long pearl which gleams between your amaranthine lips. The desert crossed, the dryness endured, the door that connects the chamber of the mind with the chamber of the heart, twisted into the shape of a dove. making camp. The evening star singing out in a sudden point of light, rotting plumes flaring on the gristle, your face framed in darkness, eyes filled with black wreaths, sweating firelight, your mouth open around my name like a tunnel through which the night pours. Sometimes through a word of yours or a gesture like the line of your jaw tipping into shadow with the great honey of longing, the path forward becomes clear. And I emerge from myself almost with splendor. A black flock of birds appearing suddenly amid the featureless white sky. All morning I walk, hillocks of pale hair among the elms. I walk, wishing to forget myself, to forget your iliac crest reflecting a streak of light. I walk, I dream my golden dream until the autumn sunlight gives way to a fast tattered sky and the rain falls in a mass of darkness and the bright bird that filled my chest is still singing, is still singing. Thank you. Please give a warm welcome to our next reader, Elisa Gabbard. I'm a little shorter than you. It's so wonderful to see all these faces in this tiny little store. <laughs> Um, it's really just such a pleasure to be reading here with these poets and people that I've known and loved for really many years. Um, thank you. I'm going to be reading from my most recent book, which is called Normal Distance. I'm gonna start with the title poem, which is called Wild Animals, Normal Distance. Watching silent films in a backyard at night, I'm distracted by a bat fluttering overhead, its flight path so erratic. A moth made bright in the projector light. The day before in the park, there were so many midges in the middle distance, we couldn't estimate their number thousands, hundreds of thousands, a raccoon in the vines on a telephone pole, baby bunny in the grass. However cute, I like to imagine it might be rabid. 
I think a little threat is necessary for happiness. I think sometimes we want to be threatened. Sometimes we want to be the threat. Sometimes when I'm standing what feels like a normal distance from a person, they keep seeming to edge away. I must keep edging closer too, or the effect would stop happening, but it continues. Like when you go into the ocean, you never come out where you went in. I'm trying to decide if Wittgenstein was sexy. It's not obvious. I think the answer is yes or unanswerable. I think delicate people are frightening, but I also think fear is erotic. Wittgenstein believed his Tractatus was the last work of philosophy that would ever need to be written, that he had answered all the important questions. He quit philosophy for a while and became an architect. He built a house for his sister she wouldn't live in. Einstein believed that publishing his theory of relativity would end all thinking about time. Now scientists believe we have a mirror universe a reflection of our universe where time flows backward from the future to the past. The arrow of time either points in one direction or in two directions, forward and back. Why not in all directions, like a minute hand? Or in all directions, like everything? I want to experience my past again, but as I was then, Doing what I did then, nothing changed. In what sense then am I not living through it again and again? Isn't the past always happening? Genealogy, such deep creases. I've known all my life that my father's Uncle Joe was killed by his wife. It was almost a novelty story, a murder in the family. At 12 or 13, I learned she was a serial killer. Joe, the third husband, she poisoned with arsenic. He was 26 when he died of kidney failure a handsome hero pilot back home safe from the war. She brought him fresh juice every day in the hospital. I was in my 30s when I found out Joe's mother, my father's grandmother, my great-grandmother, was never the same. Joe was her favorite. Her life was ruined by grief. This woman, my great-grandmother, her name was Geneva, I had forgotten. I have a black and white photo of Geneva wearing pants, about to ride on a bucket into Carlsbad Caverns. When our lives overlapped for five or six years, she seemed already dead, still and silent. I was 40 when I learned there was no suspicion of murder until the wife's young daughter started getting sick too. A life insurance scam. They exhumed my father's uncle and Joe's older brother, my father's father, my grandfather, had to identify the body. We were in a restaurant when my father told me this. How long had he been buried, I said. Months, he said, maybe a year. I thought of the word decay. These people long dead became yet more real. It's taken my whole lifetime to understand they're real. They say never forget, but you can't remember things you haven't experienced. You can't remember things you don't know, but you can remember things you don't know you know. My best friend gave me a kimono with such deep creases that they never came out in the wash, no matter how many times I washed it. 
It makes me think of a study I read about once that said butterflies remember being caterpillars. I wonder what I don't know I remember on the long, boring drive across New Mexico. It's a good kind of boring, the miles of dead nothing, and then a herd of tiny antelopes. They make me think of Auden's reindeer, moving silently and very fast, and they're all together elsewhere. There is the elsewhere in the poem, and the elsewhere of the poem. The deer are double elsewhere. There is the past of the poem, a post-war poem, and the past in the poem, which is about the fall of Rome, which I never remember. Maybe now I will remember. Malice and the Unknown. One night, drunk at a party, William Burroughs suggested a round of William Tell. His pretty young wife put a highball glass on her head. It may have had gin in it. He shot her in the face from six feet away. Burroughs was a good shot, but also very drunk. And witnesses report he looked shocked by what he'd done. But William and Joan had never played this game before. We can never know if he meant to do it. We can never really know. We can never, ever, ever, ever know. This helps me think about infinity. Increasingly, I do things to distract me from my thoughts. The distraction helps my thinking. It complicates my thoughts. It adds a mood like background music. It makes me interesting to myself. I once heard someone say, that's like drinking to remember, but I like drinking to remember. I like when bad things happen, but not the ones I was expecting. I like when something feels like a placeholder that never got replaced. I like the feeling of starting to like a thing I used to hate like cheating on myself. I like how you remember your hotel room number for the length of your stay, and then it's gone from your mind forever. I like to think about infinity, the curve that approaches the asymptote. I like to think about the difference between hearing someone lie and watching someone lie, a difference of point of view, their point of view, not mine. There are orders of infinity, infinite sets that are not only larger, but infinitely larger than the first order of infinity, but you know all this. I like thoughts before they coalesce into thoughts, before thoughts. I like when people lie a little bit and then admit it. I like when there are buildings on the sides of mountains. I like when there's a hole in the roof of a building to watch clouds blow through. Norman Mailer, also drunk at a party, stabbed his wife twice, almost in the heart, but did not kill, did not succeed in killing her. You know this, you know this. If there are infinite points between zero and one, there is infinite past, infinite points that must stay in the past where they can be protected. The past is so still. next one is called Bright and Distant Objects, and it's dedicated to Jonica. I read a headline that said, human hair behind pigeons lost toes, study finds. I thought it meant that pigeons were growing human hair behind their toes, their lost toes. I felt sick with fear. <laughs> I read a headline that said, just thinking about bright objects changes the size of your pupils. So how do we know that we're actually experiencing anything? How do we know that we're not just thinking about objects, bright and distant concepts, the future? What do we know of the actual? If you think about greyhounds, your pulse rate goes down. 
I am thinking about 16 Psyche, a metallic asteroid so massive it exerts gravitational disturbances on other asteroids. Some speculate it's composed of gold and platinum, which would make it worth quintillion dollars, or billions of times all the money on Earth. In these terms, everything in the universe is money, a concept humans made up, like emotions. In the future, objects in the universe will be so far apart that distant civilizations could never discover each other, even theoretically. They could not even think about each other. Sometimes, during a period of dread, I momentarily forget the thing I'm dreading, but continue to feel the dread. Sometimes I feel like I'm about to remember something, but the memory never arrives just the all-consuming feeling of about to. Or the memory has arrived, but it's a memory of nothing, with nothing to be about. The feeling of pure, empty remembering. If things are just themselves, what do we know of things? The moon, clouds, herons, are they decorative objects? Details on the surface of the actual? What is a human skull worth? Really, what is the cost? I want to purchase a human skull. I want to know what happens to desire when you're dead. Should your desires be respected? You can have your ashes embedded in a record so your survivors can listen to your death. You can turn all the carbon in your body into artificial diamonds. You can want that. My friend, the undertaker, wanted to be turned into a diamond and embedded in his own skull, a decorative object. An undertaker takes the body under, a coincidence of language. It's just a euphemism, an undertaking. What you wanted, once you're dead, is the real without feeling, desires with no one to want them. I'm just gonna read one more, it's called Oral History. I read somewhere that people don't mind a long wait for the elevator as long as there's a mirror in the lobby. <laughs> I read that scientists don't know why some girls' ponytails bounce up and down and other girls swing from side to side. I read on a blog comment, I feel that hot chicks just like going to public events to be hot. And on some level, I kind of agree. I once read that rich people have to invent new names because the good names get stolen by poor people. I read that the Atlas moth is born without a mouth and has one week to mate before it dies of starvation. I read about a brain imaging study that showed a dead fish could recognize human emotions. I read that plants can hear themselves being eaten. I read that Pisces dislike the past coming back to haunt. I spend a lot of time waiting around for something wonderful to happen. I often feel that I'm waiting for an unexpected life-changing force to come from nowhere, but how can it if I expect it? I feel most myself, most trapped in myself when I'm bored. I experience boredom as a kind of luxurious misery. I read that geologically speaking, we are marooned in time, nothing interesting happening for eternity, as far as we're concerned, on either side. I asked my parents if they think I look like them, and they said no. That was great. Holy shit, thanks for coming out. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm really thrilled to share this stage with my wildly talented press mate and uh, my occult poet publisher. <laughs> um, 
I'm beyond lucky to have an independent press support my work over the long haul. And it's just something I hope other presses can start doing more of, particularly for all the wildly talented writers out there, you know, who don't have the material resources to play the endless submission game, you know, or the institutional access um, to know the right people. Um, and thanks to John uh, for the introduction. So I'm coming back to Cambridge from Buffalo, uh, which is a place where the information infrastructure has largely collapsed. So people have very few ways to know about their city. Um, and in this way, Buffalo is not that much different than many small and mid-sized cities. So, so part of what I'd hope to do with, with my new book um, is just keep some, some of the stories about my city in circulation. So the first poem, uh, is about some of them, and the book is also um, sort of obsessed with garbage and waste. So the first poem is about some of the most garbage people in Buffalo and, <laughs> um, and organization. And, and it's it's kind of a crude poem. Um, you can kind of see my spasmodic settler brain at work, um, given in how it fails in its imagination. But 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 it names names um, following the poet Brandon Shimoda and, and his idea that what those whose violence is sheltered by the current power structures, you know, what they, what they desire in regard to what they've done um, is the gift of oblivion, right? The gift of oblivion. Um, and these names you won't know, so you can fill them in with the names of your own city and county power structure. Um, in this order, uh, racist developer, um, white supremacist sheriff, crime panic business association, and killer, killer cops. Okay, and this is an ongoing poem. Uh, from People Finder Buffalo. Can't dream the economy because it's good, they might repo the economy. Your, <clears throat> your bed is good, can't dream because the economy is, they might repo your good dreams. The economy is can't dream because they're good, they had the bad to get a second economy to make the rent that the body dream can be free. We're all economies, somebody are free, the common common in that freedom economy, communion only dream in that repo, freedom in that freedom repo could only be. Two, Carl P, Kiki, hangs out at JT's fungus mouth. JT's normie horror value cube urban slash JT's Carl Palladino hangs out at the dismal horizon of stage four Italian gentroids. You can, you can, 905 Elmwood bar fight. Three, Tim Howard arrests Tim Howard for murder and spends the night looking the other way as Tim Howard knocks Tim Howard's head against the hardness of the Erie County Holding Center, whispering, murderer, murderer, murderer. Five, the Allentown Association finds Allentown to queer, trans, butch, and non-binary and lodges a zoning complaint to evict Allentown from Allentown so Allentown can quietly be plaque in a dead, appropriately affluent organ. Oddly, that's the most controversial one in Buffalo. <laughs> Seven, Officer Tedesco stops Officer McAllister outside of his house in Kenmore, his house from which an American flag flies with one blue bar. Officer Tedesco demands Officer McAllister stop and show him his hands. Officer Tedesco then beats Officer McAllister with an inch of his life. So Officer Parisi, who was circling Mang Park, steps out of his vehicle and shoots Officer Tedesco 38 times. Officer Parisi and McAllister write a false report at the station. Officer Tedesco files a false report in hell. Narcotics detective Joseph Cook, during a drunk no-knock raid on the police station, stumbles and kills police officers Parisi and Tedesco. They were all thrown a parade by the Minister of Flies. All the people come to lick their shining leather while the chief of police reads collaborative Fiction, applause. My my mother asked um, after she read that poem, "Aren't you worried um, the cops are going to read it and come after you?" And I said, "Don't worry, cops don't read poetry." <laughs> I think I'm okay. The wound first. You want to light the candle. Then I want to light the candle to make the world this small at midnight. The axis of this weak one burning thought. A little ball of myrrh releases. I've learned each lesson too late. What does the candle say? Look at me. The book says, let it burn. I can't love those who say, 
let it burn. And I don't love who I was. Lying down in the dark, memory of the day, to watch a video a friend recorded with a hundred beautiful strangers seeing shut it down. I'll find the line between shut and burn. The screen dissolves. Cheryl is not yet home. Accuracy without ambition. That's all I can ask for from a poem. Mm -hmm. So those two poems are kind of in interstitial places in the book. Um, and the book is called Fugue and Strike. So I'm going to read uh, some of the fugue part, you know, which which is kind of like, you know, a mental fugue, a fugue state and finding repetitive musical form um, for all the havoc of the past five years. Um, I spent one in Ithaca and then four in the city of Buffalo, um, you know, living through the pandemic, the uprisings of 2020. Um, bad jobs, I got laid off at a cannabis farm. Um, good friends and and just the sense of being stuck on a loop, um, even as the larger world changed um, dramatically and irrevocably. Um, so some of that's in some of these poems, some of it's not. Um, but this poem is called Fugue Number Six, Jack Dads of Cornell. I don't know why the dads are so jacked. <laughs> and it's for Marty Kane. <laughs> Jack dads of Cornell are in the spirit door, the star door, where low, long I walk through the valley of food, and all that food multiplying in the sphere. To become a poet is to kill a poet, cling to a poet, in the last hour, before slipping into the drift, atoms of talk bounce in cylinders down Green Street, predictive tongue in the aleatory frame stream of vaticides in the valley of food. Jack dads of Cornell blowing their warp whistles, tech bros seduced into a sort of almost graspable grammar, pleasure without vulnerability, rob them, rob them totally, leave them drifting tongueless before the puff versus the throne. That's the title of Carrie Lorig's book, the title of this poem, The Fugue, The Fugue Number Six, Jack Dads of Cornell. Fugue number 20, Consumer Cooperative Bookstore. So this is about working at a consumer cooperative bookstore in Ithaca, New York, where the owners kind of thought they were also our bosses, which is not cool. <laughs> Be skilled in vomiting gold fog, the register of factory, the words stepping on the pedal of your tongue, Email these skilled my tongue. How it could hover with your raw parts, vomiting gold, vomiting gold. You bag a book, watch it go through the bindery and pulp at both ends. On Monday, your manager confiscated your N. On Friday, your O. You try to say no. There's just a scab in the air. During the Friday rush, you think you're being eaten alive by a pack of small dogs. On Monday, you realize, no, nah, that's too dramatic. You're just a chew toy for know-it-all adjuncts for the ruling class, which might be worse. Anyway, you go to say this to your coworker but you're both vomiting gold. <laughs> Fugue 42. Fireballs, number two. Fireballs, pastel squares and snail snares, fireballs of asters, pastors, mass, wrapped around 100 flowers, green stems, fireballs, balls of fire and fire. The world is not fire, just fireballs as liars and liars of fireballs that peel the dome of rain away. Pearl of wet rivulets you could call yours in a trail down the plate glass and I could drink a beer in the natural light of 2013 like a salamander under a rock and you could rip the fireball up around you. The house would burn and you'd be the same and I'd still be left trying to think of the title of the Frank O'Hara poem with the beautiful slope of urine and someone 
banging on metal, fireballs and mist. Though I'm trying to be over frank, there he is in my stupid brain, like a thigh-like slope of urine, banging on a piece of rebar in a dream, which is often the only information that matters. Holer than a whole note, the seed of fire and a rope of salt water slung window to window where you lived in 2009 in Baltimore in the fugue number 42, broom of an aster, kept the pay stub, but not the pay, not the damp matches of broken chemistry and fireball is replaced in the store window by a fireball's cold dust, thin film, crumbling mist, snails and pastel squares. I don't remember you. I just remember that I don't remember you in the fugue, in the fugue number 42. I often dream of the city um, that Buffalo has not become in the 10 years that I've been there. And this poem, uh, you know, is, is one of those proleptic imaginations, uh, or maybe just a poem about my train fetish. But this is called Fugue Number no. 8, Buffalo Free Rapid Transit. Plot outside of suffering on the apron of a well-worn grid, tense wheel of regression, form drakes fog, planets ride with the breathing and plot dead outside of crisis touch stitches a wheel of spores riding futures flowered from the aroma of a covered dish steadied in the cars swarm by warm fingers of milk the fugue number eight subtitle contentment form drapes magnetic plates red ride while aisles list there was a time i planned suicide like a long vacation on the apron of a well-worn grid i touched the stitches laced my world together in the car's sway there was a time i was by the warm fingers of milk and red magnetic planets then i got on the fugue number eight buffalo free rapid transit sat with the embroidery touched the stitches felt the tip of something i could not see in me that trembles something solid as a molar that grows wings and pools roots ripping from the plot outside of suffering gum of my body buffalo's aisles lean in the stream and it left a socket with the breathing and the present departed on the train my apron dilated my nipple opened plot outside of suffering a bee flew in planets of fog impulse walks i could feel them in me the comb made of honey it would be a job to know okay the fugue number eight buffalo free rapid transit plot outside of suffering So uh, that's the fugue part. <laughs> I got to stop touching the mic. Um, I'm going to read a small, I'm going to read a bit of the strike part. Um, I'm not going to read some of the more performative bits, but I'll give you some context. Um, the strike parts uh, are about waste, um, militant actions that have involved waste and strikes by sanitation workers um, from the 17th century uh, to, to the you know 2020, I don't know, 2019, um, and some of the strikes that surrounded COVID. And this is the this is the the small essay that ends ends that bit. Um, it's called Polymer Meteor. Um, and and so you know, at this point, we've gone a little bit of way looking at trash and meditating on garbage. Um, so Polymer Meteor. George Oppen wrote in discrete series "Rooms Out Last You," pithy, and also indicative of a relation to time that is modest and sobering. We die, apartments go on. The floors get scratched by someone else's chairs. Their vents fill with the dust of someone else's life. But those rooms also go, demolished to make way for some other pricier structure. Or those rooms are split open by moisture and creatures seeking shelter in a zone of divestment, a frame of time in which things live decades to centuries. When I was 32, I saw the green thread of a seedling peeking out of a tub drain. A tangle of my partner's hair in coconut oil shampoo held the seed in the drain where it was rinsed by our showers. I squatted in the shower and pulled the plug of hair and seedling, then held this assemblage in my naked damp hand. Where did the seed come from? I'd been eating flax seeds with my oatmeal. This one must have escaped the coffee grinder in my teeth, 
traveled placidly through yards of my intestine and because of its glutinous hull got stuck in the hairs of my dank parts after a shit until I showered. My consumption had failed to destroy. That which was shit was already blooming. This drain seedling was my small window into a pre-modern world of fast cycling matter. One's refuse didn't always travel far. Dinner scraps shot back to life from the heap. Though the majority of people, oh, this is me reminding myself to hurry up. All right, thanks. Okay, thanks, old me. Um, <laughs> though the majority uh, of people and things live short lives, they also sometimes live short and public afterlives. It would not be strange to think that was lost or tossed would return, where the thread of its life would wind its way into a different vessel. If time, endurance, was weight before and alongside industrial modernity, many things must have seemed light. And if life didn't last, what endured was its medium, soil, a Renaissance master gardener. Quote, there's nothing but what may serve to amend the earth or soil returning to it by way of corruption under whatever figure it returns to it. All manner of stuff, linen, flesh, skin, bones, nails of animals, dirt, urine, excrement, the wood of trees, their fruit, their leaves, ashes, straw, all manner of corn or grains, etc. Rooms outlast us. But the contents of an already resellable cell phone will outlast the room. It will also outlast most soils. Petroleum-based polymers will take their place alongside the mineral exerting their own kind of geology, a geologic force that may outlast the assemblages of power that birthed it long after they boil themselves to death through carbon emissions. So given that we, flesh, are affiliated with so many polymor immortals, I would like to suggest that we imagine future time as present weight in order to see the world. If long after our bodies die, the case of a cell phone lives on into thousands of years, its mass multiplied by all that time would be unliftable. It would break your floor. Our world is full of things swirling with the potential and marvelous mass of asteroids, and these things will become particles of long chain polymers, rinds of codes and electronics turned into leachate, chemistry spilling across virtual and material borders, attenuated bacteria and fungi blooming in subterranean, oceanic and tropospheric masses, new ecologies. Karen Brodine, the great socialist feminist typesetting poet wrote, quote, make your hands move quickly on the keys, fast as you can while you are thinking about the layers, fossils, the idea that this machine she controls is simply layers of human work, hours frozen in steel, tangled in tiny circuits, blinking out through lights like hot red eyes. As long as our labor is lost to ourselves and those we'd be in solidarity with, might these tangles of junk be our final purgatorial vessel? That is, as long as we labor in normal time and do not or cannot enter revolutionary time, or maybe we should call it solidarity time. Foam of an office chair, a name tag, some pounded on keys, this dock perpetually reanimated by the energy of an archive, our hot red eyes mute, frozen, except for the slow blink of consciousness to a poet like Brody. And capitalists will work future generations into these geologies of human residue. From Xi Jingnan's great poem entitled, quote, production in the middle of production is soaked by production. In links, by deep links, deeper and deeper links. Then I'm baffled by the light. I'm a railroad tie under the light. Almost there. This is not a pop-up for organic farming, metal straws, or a compost theology, but toward an understanding of the distribution of endurance and force. This is to say we're constantly shedding 10,000 pound nails, sweating out ponds of oil, shitting forests, imperfectly aligned with capitalist production, a thumb over the hose, a wild chaotic force in orbit, which we can channel into open-ended projects of opposition and solidarity. Solidarity? Here's Dario Azzolini in Communes and Workers Control in Venezuela, quote, an open category constituted in struggle, which people can join, end quote. I dream of the time when it is the red hot eyes of executives and cops looking out from the rubble, the decommissioned salvage yards where the liquidators no longer get to enjoy oblivion or put their names on monuments substituted for public goods. Rather, the liquidators are finally frozen in the rubble, stuck as the mute and frustrated ghosts of this savage time. All right, thanks for letting me read the essay. Thank you. <laughs>